there seems to be also a lot of populist movements happening in in but, yeah. in yeah. uh continental Europe. I mean there's the five star and the Lega in Italy and the mm -hmm. Brothers of Italy, uh Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands. Uh, and more notably, with the election coming up, uh, Le Pen and uh, Zemmour uh, yes. are, are going in France. Uh, um, well, Le Pen's see... linked to a much older movement there, uh, yeah. which is, was a much older right-wing nationalist movement. Um, but yes, yes, you're right. And then the, the, can't forget, you know, uh, AFD in Germany. Yeah. Um, you know. There's, there's been a variety. Most of them have uh, similarities. Uh, I was going to say yellow jackets uh, in um, France as well, which is a more spontaneous movement um, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know more organised movements. AFD was quite organised. Um, mm -hmm. There were was it Pegida? There was an earlier mm -hmm. yeah, movement yeah. that was uh, less organised. Um, but they're more spontaneous movements. Um, they're the interesting ones. M5S, wow. M5S is fascinating um, as a constructed movement. I'll play some movie. Sorry, it was constructed. Right? It was star. intentional. Yes, five star. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It was allowed to be amorphous at the early stages, but it was constructed. It was started by it was two people who set it up, um, set up the mechanisms. Uh, you know, happened that Beppo Grillo, who you know, was a television star, comedian again. Ha ha ha! Something about comedians. Mm -hmm. um, and Castle Hedgehog uh, as well. He yeah. was more like the yes. the he's the, he's the he's the mind. He's the mind behind it, and, and Beppe Grillo was more like the face. Yes, and he was like the driving force. Yeah, um, but there you match a, a populist, right, with someone who's got an idea about how to create mechanism. So it's a constructed movement, not a pop, not not a your standard um, spontaneous movement. Yellow Jackets is much more spontaneous. Um, if you you know you can, there's a bunch of anarchist movements in out yeah, that came out of Italy that were much more spontaneous. Black Block was was a was as Black Block a creation, but that's a bunch of anarchists. Um, the the whole Freedom Convoy stuff uh, is in one sense created, but it's got so many different travellers. It's much more spontaneous um, than uh, I think we realize it's it's not it's not a oh it's the same old bunch of right wing nutters it's like no no there's a whole bunch of different people who've, who've not just climbed on the bandwagon this is there's these different groups and they've made new connections and mm -hmm. you know they don't they don't agree other than they don't like the government that's what they agree on um yellow jackets has operated in the same way and so they've been able to put pressure on government some of the others though are more organized and that's what they've become it's far more organized but, but um, it, so isn't that a natural progression though like you start as a movement and then eventually you enter politics so you have to at least get organized like the idea of the five star being constructed isn't that not really anything new where you have this populist feeling but to get organized you have to construct a party you have to get into politics there was a bunch of a bunch i'll give you an example there was a bunch of student movements in the us uh in the late 60s and into the early 70s sds and sns now they were very powerful in that they were able to organize um as a bunch of disparate groups of people um spontaneous organizations erupting in different universities across america they could put on marches and indeed, you know, do do the Portland thing, essentially take over parts of city, not unlike Occupy. But the moment you tried to form it into an organization, the whole thing fell apart. The whole point of it was that they were able to be spontaneous, to act spontaneously. Occupy worked because it was spontaneous. The moment you tried to organize it into the Occupy Party, you'll say, well, I wasn't interested in a party. You know, the point is, this this is not about being organised to take take control, take power, but it to express opposition to how things have been going. And we don't have, you know, Occupy didn't have one set of simple demands because mm -hmm. it couldn't. It was too many different demands. Mm -hmm. um, so the Freedom Convoy can't have one simple set of demands that government can then deal with and can then talk to. It has a whole lot of, in fact, at times contradictory demands. Uh, the moment you try and organise it, 
that's it'll start to dissipate because people will go, well, you haven't taken care of my demand or I was here because I hate the government or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Spontaneous movements are really interesting um, because they can create new organisations, but more likely they won't create organisations or those organisations will exist between times. Peace, peace movements are a classic for this. They'll erupt. You know, 2003, the uh, anti-Iraq invasion marches got millions of people onto the streets around the world, well, tens of millions. You know, there was you know, how many in, in Sydney? A quarter of a million. But unheard of. I mean, Hyde Park was literally awash with people. It was jam-packed, wall-to-wall <laughs> people, a lot of people. Um, try and organise them? No, suppose. All that energy just somehow, you know, where did it all go? They so, said, well, people needed to express how they felt. They came out, they expressed it. But you can't actually try and organise them because they're expressing different things in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on opposition to war in general, on opposition to this particular attack, um, uh, an opposition to US imperialism or Australian involvement overseas, I mean, all of these different things. You know, um, the organised movement's been successful. M5S, as I said, constructed. It was allowed to then develop. Um, that's, again, what makes it interesting is that it was then allowed to have lots of people engaged and involved. Still uh, at least partly controlled from the centre. That's all been, that was then slowly removed as the party started to grow and take, take on well, seats, win seats. Well, 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 yeah, well um... In my observation of the Five Star Movement, uh, it started off well enough. It got built up momentum. It got set to win offices and and, and local level there. For a for outside movement, they went pretty well in 2018. They became the coalition government with the with another populist uh, mm. uh, party, the the Savini's Lega, and um, but I think. The last, they're losing a lot of support nowadays because they've basically sold out to the very establishment they were supposed to well, rebel against. Liga um, Lord, though, has been around for years and is part of the establishment. It's been around for quite some right? time. It's popular, Liga Nord, um, the Northern League has been around. Oh, oh Liga, yeah. Savini and so on. It's been around for quite some time. But it's Savini, established. But Savini's it, it's, Liga it's, is it's different oh, from yeah. the regional. Oh, yeah, I agree. But it's populist in its uh, nature. It's less of a movement and more a populist party. Yeah. Whereas uh, you know, um, M5S is actually more uh, a movement and less of a party. And when you try to make the party out of it, you see defections. You see, you know, uh, mayors of this or the MPs going off and doing other things, saying, that's not what I joined. And mm. I joined this other more vibrant blah, 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 blah thing. So people then rejecting it and yes their votes collapse essentially and they will dissipate um over time um i think the, the nature of italian politics is that there'll be yeah. another five okay, different started. parties yes. <laughs> it's you a know. mess <laughs> yeah it, but you know that's that, that is literally the nature of italian politics i think people have to get used to the idea there's always going to be lots of little parties and lots of little connections that's fine you know, as long as you can actually have a functioning government of some level, mm. um, and it always used to be the the, the joke uh, that uh, you had an election, you have 500 parties, and the economy got stronger. You try to cut it down so you had one party in charge, and the economy fell apart. <laughs> right. You know, perhaps if you, you left the left it to work away, and they got the basics done, mm. then yes, the economy does well. But when you have, uh, you know, this was part of the argument. You put you put uh, ideological parties in charge. Ah, uh, that's when things start going wrong. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it hasn't worked that way in other countries. You know, um, I think it's got much more to do with uh, the Italian politics and the structure of Italian politics and mm. the divisions within it between north and south, between country well, and city. city. Well, Italy. Uh, that's the most frustrating thing about Italy. Uh, if they can get the politics together, Italy will be seen as a much more powerful country than what it is. It really is, but people overlook it. I mean, 
in the EU, people just say, oh, Germany and France, but Italy's the third major party uh, country there. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, the Treaty of Rome was yeah. signed. Oh, uh, you know, the, the but, economy. But keep in mind, though, the EU was set up for a very specific reason, which was to stop France and Germany fighting. Yeah. And it was to corral them. You know? True, true. But, but my point being, Italy's like, usually gets seen as the idiot cousin. Yes, that's you right. Know? Yeah. And, um, the economy is very, the, the amount of innovation that comes out of Italy, I, I saw a list the other day, even I was surprised. And that's yeah. my background. They Quite a lot of innovation coming up that, out of there. Quite well, a lot of, the economy, despite all the problems, it's still quite up there. It's still a member of the yeah. G, the G uh, seven. And they're still, I mean, and that's with their, it, uh, their politics uh, being a mess. If they can just get the politics done right everything you will be such an elevation for them oh, but, uh, I, but i wonder really, daniel i actually think really it's the other way around. that one thing uh, and i i think the politics is it's the nature of italian politics you know it's you know you go to germany and it's very ordered and somber and boring right um, <laughs> you know you go to italy and it's all over the place but things get done all the same and indeed the economy i mean the economy was i remember the i've been seeing the rankings and going it's actually got a huge economy <laughs> and we shouldn't ever discount Italy as a, an economic power. And yes, it totally is a, a highly innovative um, country, always has been. Um, it, it's why it considered itself you know, an imperial power, a world power, you know, certainly in the 30s. Um, it, its politics went a little bit screwy at the time, but hey, you know, every country has its foibles. <laughs> Yeah, to say the least, to say the least, yeah. Um, but with Italy, I think it was the seventies and maybe eighties. It was probably at its most stable, at its most yes. uh, post post World War, at least. It was yeah. probably that's the high point for Italy. Uh, I think Kratzi was the last like stable prime minister, the leader that the country had. As bad as he was in the end, he, yes. he, he went, he went so in, deeply corrupt. He, yeah, he went into exile and corrupt and, and all yeah. that. But as the functioning of a country, he was still very stable and going very oh, yeah. well. After him, as bad as he was, I don't think Italy ever really recovered. Well, into that, the, the interestingly, level. it slipped into either um, you know, technocratic leadership or populism. Um, mm. And that's the way it seems to have gone. I mean, the, the, the huh, who have you had? You know? oh, Berlusconi. Like, like Draghi and a few others. But yeah. yes, Berlusconi. Berlusconi's mentor was Craxi. Yeah. Know? So, you know, Berlusconi learnt from the best, as it were, um, or the worst, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, but he was populist, very populist. Mm. No, Grio and Salvini, only populists right um you know this isn't the 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 dour christian democrats right this isn't the you know somewhat radical but actually deeply establishment communists mm, right? the pd these days yeah mm. yeah yeah mm. right? so um anyway you know italian politics being what it is um you're right though italy is a, a highly innovative large economically um, country that has an interesting politics that actually still functions it's still a democratic nation it hasn't fallen into you know some form of dictatorship again and it doesn't look like it's even likely to people might say oh you're a bunch of fascists you let you know alessandro mussolini is so what it happens you know they don't catch yeah. you perfect um but, no, but uh, you know but but also you know like she gets between one and three percent. Who cares? You know, she's not getting fifty percent or even thirty percent of the vote. No, she's mm. getting nothing. You know, which tells you the support isn't there. You couldn't run a country with that. You know? mm -hmm. um, keeping with uh, Europe, uh, with the upcoming French election, what's your observations about what's happening there? <sighs> I'll end up with Macron again because. No one else is able to tip him out um, because they won't. They can't. Um, they can't go to the the, the right. The, the left will get together to, to keep the right out. But you know, Melenchon's you know 
past that was talk had, 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 um, what's her name Hidalgo, Hidalgo um, from PS is <laughs> polling what six percent you know <laughs> you know this is nothing Macron's the only person who's out there whose party is leading he'll be in the second round you know um, he will end up with Macron again because who else are you going to vote for? Uh, that's the that's the real issue. What happens in the uh, National Assembly later on? Well, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, that's when you can see different alliances appear, and that's when I think Macron's party might. Well, it will take some huge hits, um, but that's happened before. You know, we've had presidents and prime ministers have been from different parties. Um, okay. But it's amazing that Macron, uh, he's been polling very low for most of the five years. You had the yellow jacket. He's still jacket. polling 25%. He's still polling 25%, and that's all you need. Yeah, or, if yeah. nobody else is getting it, then you're still the top dog. Because yeah. remember, it's that two-round system. It's not, you know, it's not an alternative vote. It's not proportional representation. It's, you know, it's a two-round system. And then you get more than 12.5% of the total population, total vote voting for you. Um, which is, so it's not 12.5% of the votes cast, 12.5% of the total uh, electors. Um, he'll get 20, 25% and he's in. And then it's a case of, so who's the challenger? Who's the other one, right, that's, mm -hmm. that's going to get over that, the, that mark? Who else is going to get 20%? Um, and it's like, well, this, I go, what options do you have? You know? well, well, you know, obviously the two in contention for the yes. for the challenger is going to be Zamor or Le Pen. Yes. And they're both about 17, 15 yes. percent, like, essentially neck and neck. Yeah. And, you know, eventually one of them is going to fall. And there's so many similarities in their supporters. Yeah. You know, whoever is going to win, their their support is going to just gravitate towards them. So, and my calculation, it'll be maybe just enough to be a little bit above Macron. Yeah, I mean could, that doesn't matter. That actually your, doesn't matter. But you could know, the right that, win win at all? Either Le Pen or, or Zemmour in the end? I don't think either of those two. I mean, you don't have I don't, a think, Le, I don't think I don't think Le Pen can. Can win. I think Le Pen has got too much baggage. Um, that doesn't I, I, rule out another the right challenger. Well, I think Le Pen's niece just recently came out and supported publicly Zemmour, which is uh, uh, yeah. a big news <laughs> in French politics. Um, do you think it would be Zemmour versus Macron? Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. If I was going to pick one, that's probably where I go. But you know, if, if that means we end up with that's the final two, then I think I still think Macron could Macron should win that. Whether would he it, does, you know, would it be a question. would it be a close battle though? They're always close battles. The left and the right they line up really nicely. You know? they really do. Um, every oh, well. now and then it's an overwhelming one, but you know that's usually because your challenge is crap. You know. Well, I, I think I think Macron soundly beat Le Pen in the in the final round last election. Well, yes, sound, soundly, but nonetheless, you know, there's there's uh, she had a hell of a good vote for someone from the far right. <laughs> yeah, but 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 that has changed even since then. If yeah. in the yeah. five five years, it's been yes, yeah. the yellow jacket movements, the people very angry with Macron yep. before he was a fresh unknown face. Yep. Now we know him, uh, and um, there's so many things that happened. And Zemmour seems to be trying to pull a Trump in being this outsider yep. businessman type. Yep. Um, did he, does he have a shot of actually pulling up an upset? Oh, you know, um, I think that's what, well, that's what everybody thought Le Pen would do last time. Um, uh, that's all right. Um, so but, anyway, everybody thought but that, Mac, that. But Macron was still unknown at the time. Now we know him. So would that hurt him more? I'm just trying to put my phone away. Uh, I think the baggage that he's picked up over the last five years, yeah, that's that's real. Um, he has to overcome that. I can't help feeling, though, sometimes the, the baggage you pick up is actually 
from uh, the people who aren't your supporters, i.e., you know, were Yellow Jackets ever going to vote for you? Well, you know, it's like, it's like why does you know, um, Scott Morrison not care when people go out and protest about immigration, like that we should have, you know, free the refugees or climate change? Because he's going, they're not going to vote for me anyway. Right. You know? There's mm. the calculation that's going on. Um, that, that machine politics will say they're not our voters. We're not trying to get them. You know, right. we aim at this other group. You know, so Macron can try and be the the, the global leader, sh shuttle diplomacy. You know, still trying to get Putin to pull back. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you pull that off, everybody say a French leader you know, right. brought world peace. Uh, you know? Know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, even if he doesn't, you know, he's put up a good show as a, as a true European, uh, mm. someone who's tried to bring peace. Uh -huh. um, that helps. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, most of the problems for uh, uh, Macron are not necessarily in his making. Mm -hmm. They're compounding problems from pre previous from Holland and, and others, um, like Libya. You know, and the spillover from Libya. Mm -hmm. A spillover from intervention, in Libya, you know, a spillover from Tunisia, uh, unrest in Algeria. So all these things have spillovers. So you have thousands of people trying to get through, um, tens of thousands of people trying to get through. You know, there's, it's what Spain faces every time it annoys, you know, um, Mohammed of Morocco is, you know, oh, 20,000 people turn up at the borders of Suata and Melilla, right, trying to get in, and they do. Uh, they're, they're quite successful. And so that Spain is stuck taking more refugees. So the refugee crisis, which affects actually Italy the worst, Italy mm. and Greece, um, is also propelled and promoted by actions they've taken in the past, you know, mm. that are then sweeping up. So Alger uh, Algeria is not a, you know, a problem for what they did in the 50s. It's what's, what happened in 2011. You know, yeah, the Arab Spring. So there's still, you know, there's still all this stuff still happening in the background, um, and that drives, you know, ten thousand people sitting in Calais wanting to get across to the UK. You know, um, therein lies a problem, and you know, it's in part where Yellow Jacket started from. And so it then comes down into Paris. So it's like, what about subsidies? We want to continue to have. What about subsidies? They're subsidies after all. Mm. Come on, guys. But, you know, it's what drives, well, I'll give you another example, um, huge rallies in Indonesia uh, against Jokowi. Why? He tried to reduce the fuel subsidy. Right? And people went, oh, fuel's going to be so expensive. It's like, it's still a subsidy, guys. <laughs> it's right. like you're getting something for free. <laughs> Right, yeah, uh, it's a bit too uh, used to it. So that's right. That's got, basically it, you know. Yeah. Um, you guys are all on welfare. Hey, I'm not on welfare. So, well, your fuel's subsidised, right? And, and for French farmers, it's well, your farm produce is, is um, there. Now, it may not be bad, a bad thing. Protectionism has, has been used by you know, politicians and governments for you know, a gazillion years, and many still use it mm -hmm. very effectively. You know, to protect produce or production. Um, not when it's wasteful. That's that's a bad thing. Although you know the, the propping up the Chinese government does of all its various industries, you know, building industry, steel industry, whatever, you know, to keep the mills turning, to keep people in work, to keep the economy generating. At some point, you start to run into problems with money, you know? mm -hmm. and that's where you know every French president runs into a slight problem with money because you know you're giving it out all over the place, or you've got to give it to the EU. And it's like, oh crap, you know, that's three, another 300 million you know, um, euros right. going away. It's like, oh, hang on a sec, do I have that? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Britain's complaint, you know, all that money we're giving to the EU, we could spend here. Right. Which, of course, they didn't do. You know, I said, oh, we'll have put an extra 300 million a week into NHS, except they never did. Right. But if they had, um, one, pandemic might not have been quite as nasty as it was in the UK. Mm -hmm. Two, People would love you, you know, right? They don't love well, well, Boris. Yeah, well, either that more of a failure of the 
internal politics as opposed to uh, pulling out, pulling the promises was sound, but it just wasn't implemented. Yes and no. I mean, was the was the promise sound? Um, when you disentangle yourself from a huge trading block that you were once part of and had the benefits of being part of, um, you know, yes, you gain the the um, amorphousness of sovereignty, whatever that actually means, because they were still a sovereign nation. It's like, mm -hmm. well, we got our sovereignty back. So you never lost it. It was still England, you know. You still had your own laws. Oh, yes, you'd agreed to be part of supernatural, supernatural, supernational. Um, supranational laws or lawmaking, mm. which you had a veto in. <laughs> you could always say no. <laughs> right. That's the thing that's always forgotten. So no, there's a veto. There's vetoes for things, you know. Um, Denmark held out for, for years on uh, Maastricht. So, you know, um, it's, it's entirely possible to say, no, we don't, we don't agree with that. We don't agree with all these provisions. We have to be part of it. In fact, Britain had been part of, you know, constructing the, the, the EU, big hand in making things change, mm -hmm. um, which is often forgotten by Brexit campaigners. That said, Brexit campaigners didn't think they were going to win. You know, it was part of a political movement to gain, you know, political uh, power, but not necessarily to win. Winning then means you have to implement. Implementation is hard. Well, really hard. that's the whole thing with Johnson, in my opinion. Uh, I think he ran last minute on being a Brexiteer. He, I think he did it with the idea that he would lose the the referendum. Yeah. But, but he will be seen as the champion of Euroscepticism mm. within the within the Tory party. And when he challenge, and it was only a matter of time when he goes to the leadership, he could he could rally all the Eurosceptics yep. with him, but and say, "Oh, I we didn't win it, but I put my neck out, and I'm yep. one of you, uh, and I'd also kill or shoot the UKIP fox at the time." You yes, know? that's right, exactly uh, right. And um, and then um, then he uh, he was so shocked when the <laughs> when the results came in. And they actually won, and now he's like, "Oh, damn! I'm going to have to do it." That's right. Uh, uh, and um, uh, that's why I think um, even now he's kind of dragging the feet and doing a little bit of this. They're doing almost doing the bare minimum compared well, I mean, to they've done what Theresa they May. Can. Yeah. Um, Compared to Theresa May, he, he do, he, he's done a lot, but um, still not to what the Brexit types would have wanted. Um, well, the, the, the problem remains, though, that, you know, that the, the, if the Brexiteers wanted Britain of the 19th century, you can't have that. Uh, that was the 19th century to start with. Um, international law, trade barriers, all, the, the, the whole infrastructure of international law, the superstructure of international law has changed. Trading patterns have changed. The ability to build and run an empire has changed. There is no empire, you know. <laughs> so all the factors that made, you know, sovereign Britain, you know, the John Bull Britain great, right? they don't exist. They're just not there. Mm -hmm. So you've got to create a different kind of Britain. No, you can't recreate all the old industries. Oh, we were, you know, we used to make steel. It's like, yeah, you had iron and coal, right? But you can't use coal. You can't mine coal and burn it because that creates another problem, right? Your, your shitty weather gets even shittier, right? Um, you know, climate change. I mean, the Tories have accepted mostly, you know, that this climate change is happening. You know, um, that some of them are still not on board, but most of them are. Most of them recognise as a problem. And mm -hmm. in fact, they've, they've switched off coal. They've stopped mining the stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to recreate the old industries. They're just not there to create. Mm -hmm. You can't recreate the fishing industries that you once had. The fish aren't there. They've been fished out. Mm -hmm. So you, you run into resource problems. 
So you have to then try and be creative around, you know, what are the new industries that, that the UK can be in? Oh, well, the city will keep us up. Well, that's fine for the city, for London. Mm. Oh, what about Sheffield, Manchester? Oh, what about all the other cities in England? You know, Nottingham or Leeds, you know, or you know, Newcastle, Durham. What do they do? Or oh, does everybody just have to look at London? That's the thing about the fascinating thing about Brexit is that London didn't vote for it. Right? London was really happy to be part of Europe because mm. so it works for everybody in London. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and yet here we are saying, well, perhaps we need to look to London to, to get us out of this. It's like, guys, <laughs> they, knew what, they knew where this was going. They knew it was not going to be easy. And it's still not easy. And you're going to have to pay more for stuff. And your supply chains don't work. And you can't get the driver. And blah, 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 blah. You know, there's, again, all these compounding factors, which is the hard part of public policy. Uh, I'll put on my other hat. You know, it's the hard part of public policy is implementation. Right? You, you get up with all the... It's the same with war. You know, the thing about the, uh, you know, the, best, the best plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. You know? Right, that's the same for, for a lot of public policy. But but uh, having said that, the last election we had the crumbling of the of the red wall. I mean, massive working class vote went towards uh, Johnson. Um, uh, you know, landslide victory. Uh, they, they say that UKIP and the Brexit Party was like the uh, the the gateway drug <laughs> for partisan votes. You know, they, they couldn't bring themselves to vote Tory, but they could bring themselves to vote Farage and then maybe eventually vote Tory if they have to. And I think that's what happened in, in the last election. Coming up with the next election coming up already, um, what do you see what's happening in, in, in Britain? Yeah, there's a lot of the old, old Labour Red Wall vote uh, saying they're so disenchanted with Johnson, uh, they might actually go reform UK or or some other minor vote. It's fine. Do you see that? It's Remember, it's first past the post. It's a first past the post system. Wandering, you know, if half your vote wanders off, you know, to and you and you, you got 50% and half your vote wanders off to vote for someone else, right? It usually means that, that you're the Conservative Party, it usually means the Labour Party is going to win. All right. You know, that's what it means. First past the post is one of those systems that, uh, that if you've got to be strategic in your voting, or if you're just dis disaffected, you might go, why would I bother voting for a minor party? I might as well just stay home. 